the world in seventy-two days by nelly bly chapter ten in the pirate seas one night after i had been five days in colombo the blackboard in the hotel corridor bore the information that the oriental would sail for china the following morning at eight o'clock i was called at five o'clock and some time afterwards left for the ship the spanish minister as we called the spaniard wanted me to go to some of the shops with him until he should buy some jewelry but i was so nervous and anxious to be on my way that i could not wait a moment longer than was necessary to reach the boat that was to carry me to china when farewells had been said and i was on the oriental i found my patience had given way under the long delay the ship seemed to be deserted when i went on deck with the exception of a handsome elderly man accompanied by a young blond man in a natty white linen suit who slowly promenaded the deck while watching out to sea while they talked i was trying to untie my steamer chair so as to have some place to sit when the elderly man came up and politely offered to assist me when will we sail i asked shortly as soon as the nepal comes in the man replied she was to have been here at daybreak but she hasn't been sighted yet waiting for the nepal has given us this five days delay she's a slow old boat may she go to the bottom of the bay when she does get in i said savagely the old tub i think it an outrage to be kept waiting five days for a tub like that colombo is a pleasant place to stay the elderly man said with a twinkle in his eye it may be if staying there does not mean more than life to one really it would afford me the most intense delight to see the nepal go to the bottom of the sea evidently my ill-humor surprised them and their surprise amused me for i thought how little anyone could realize what this delay meant to me and the mental picture of a forlorn little self creeping back to new york ten days behind time with a shamed look on her face and afraid to hear her name spoken made me laugh outright they gazed at me in astonishment while i laughed immoderately at my own unenviable position my better nature surged up with the laugh and i was able to say once again everything happens for the best there is the nepal i said pointing out a line of smoke just visible above the horizon they doubted it but a few moments proved that i was correct i am very ill-natured i said glancing from the kindly blue eyes of the elderly man to the laughing blue eyes of the younger man but i could not help it after being delayed for five days i was called at five o'clock because they said the ship was to sail at eight and here it is nine o'clock and there's no sign of the ship sailing and i am simply famished as they laughed at my woes the gong sounded for breakfast and they took me down the irish lad with his sparkling eyes and jolly laugh was there as was a young englishman who had also travelled on the ship victoria to colombo i knew him by sight but as he was a sworn woman-hater i did not dare to speak to him there were no women on board i was the only woman that morning and a right jolly breakfast we had the captain a most handsome man and as polite and as courteous as he was good-looking sat at the head of the table officers that any ship might boast of were gathered about him handsome good-natured intelligent polite they were every single one of them i found the elderly man i had been talking to was the chief engineer and the young man was the ship's doctor the dining hall was very artistic and pleasant and the food was good the ship although much smaller than the victoria was very much better in every way the cabins were more comfortable the ship was better ventilated the food was vastly superior the officers were polite and good-natured the captain was a gentleman in looks and manners and everything was just as agreeable as it could be for several days i let things go on and said nothing about myself nor did i give them the letter which the london agent had kindly sent it had brought me no attention or courtesy on the victoria and i decided to take my chances on the oriental when i saw that uniform kindness and politeness was the rule on this ship i then gave them the letter and though the captain was pleased to receive it still it could not have made his treatment of me any kinder than it was at first it was well on to one o'clock before the passengers were transferred from the nepal to the oriental 
In the meantime the ship was amply peopled with merchants from the shore, who were selling jewels and lace. How they did cheat the passengers! They would ask and sometimes get fabulous prices for things, and when the ship was ready to sail, they offered to sell at any price. They were quite saucy chaps, too. I heard a vendor reply to a man who offered him a small price for some so-called precious stones. I am not charging you for looking at these. In fact, they grew so impudent and bold that I am surprised that the steamship lines do not issue orders prohibiting their presence on board. At one o'clock we sailed. The first day and the two days following were passed lazily on deck. I found it a great relief to be again on the sweet blue sea, out of sight of land, and free from the tussle and worry and bustle for life which we are daily, hourly even, forced to gaze upon on land. Although the East is, in a very great measure, free from the dreadful crowding for life, still one is bound to see signs of it even among the most indolent of people. Only on the bounding blue, the grand great sea, is one rocked into a peaceful rest at noon of day, at dusk of night, feeling that one is drifting, drifting, not seeing or knowing or caring about fool mortals striving for life. True, the sailors do this and that, but it has an air far from that of elbowing each other for a living. To the lazy passengers, it seems that they merely hoist a sail or pull it down, that they may drift, dream, sleep, talk, live for happiness and not for gain. The fourth day out was Sunday. The afternoon was spent on deck looking at the most beautiful green islands which we slowly passed. Sometimes we would lazily conjecture as to whether they were inhabited or not. The next day we anchored at Penang, or Prince of Wales Island, one of the Straits settlements. As the ship had such a long delay at Colombo, it was said that we would have but six hours to spend on shore. With an acquaintance as an escort, I made my preparations and was ready to go land the moment we anchored. We went ashore in a sampan, an oddly shaped flat boat with the oars, or rather paddles, fastened near the stern. The Malay oarsman rode hand over hand, standing upright in the stern, his back turned towards us as well as the way we were going. Frequently he turned his head to see if the way was clear, plying his oars industriously all the while. Once landed, he chased us to the end of the pier, demanding more money, although we had paid him thirty cents, just twenty cents over and above the legal fare. Hiring a carriage, we drove to where a waterfall comes bounding down the side of a naturally verdant mountain, which had been transformed halfway up into a pleasing tropical garden. The picturesque waterfall is nothing marvelous. It only made me wonder from whence it procured its water supply. But after walking until I was much heated and finding myself apparently just as far from the fount, I concluded the waterfall's secret was not worth the fatigue it would cost. On the way to the town we visited a Hindu temple. Scarcely had we entered when a number of half-clad, barefooted priests rushed frantically upon us, demanding that we remove our shoes. The temple being built open, its curved roof and rafters had long been utilized by birds and pigeons as a bedroom. Doubtless ages had passed over the stone floor, but I could swear nothing else had, so I refused emphatically and unconditionally to unboot myself. I saw enough of their idols to satisfy me. One was a black god in a gay dress. The other was a shapeless black stone hung with garlands of flowers, the filthy stone at its base being buried beneath a profusion of rich blossoms. English is spoken less in Penang than any port I visited. A native photographer, when I questioned him about it, said, The Malays are proud, miss. They have a language of their own, and they are too proud to speak any other. That photographer knew how to use his English to advantage. He showed me cabinet-sized proofs for which he asked one dollar each. One dollar! I exclaimed in astonishment. That is very high for a proof. If Miss thinks it is too much, she does not need to buy. She is the best judge of how much she can afford to spend, he replied with cool impudence. Why are they so expensive? I asked, nothing daunted by his impertinence. I presume because Penang is so far from England, he rejoined carelessly. 
I was told afterwards that a passenger from the Oriental pulled the photographer's long, thin, black nose for his impudence, and I was pleased to hear it. A Chinese joss house, the first I had seen, was very interesting. The pink and white roof, curved like a canoe, was ornamented with animals of the dragon tribe, with their mouths open and their tails in the air. The straggling worshippers could be plainly seen from the streets through the arcade sides of the temple. Chinese lanterns and gilt ornaments made gay the dark interior. Little josses, with usual rations of rice, roast pig, and smoldering joss sticks dispersing a strangely sweet perfume, were no more interesting than a dark corner in which the superstitious were trying their luck, a larger crowd of dusky people than were about the altars. In fact, the only devotee was a wax-haired Chinese woman, with a slit-eyed brown babe tied on her back, bowing meekly and lowly before a painted bejangled joss. Some priests with shaven heads and old gold silk ornaments, who were in a summer house in the garden, saw us when we were looking at the goldfish ponds. One came forth, and, taking me by the hand, gracefully led me to where they were gathered. They indicated their wish that we would sit with them and drink tea with them, milkless and sugarless, from childlike china cups, which they refilled so often that I had reasons for feeling thankful the cups were so like unto play dishes. We were unable to exchange words, but we smiled liberal smiles at one another. Mexican silver is used almost exclusively in Penang. American silver will be accepted at the same value, but American gold is refused, and paper money is looked on with contempt. The Chinese jinrickshaw men in Penang, compared with those in Colombo, are like overfed pet horses, beside racers in the trim. They were the plumpest Chinamen I ever saw, such round fat legs and arms. When we started back to the ship, the bay was very rough. Huge waves angrily tossed our small boat about, in a way that blotted the red from my escort's cheeks, and caused him to hang his head in a care-for-nothing way over the boat's side. I could not help likening the sea to a coquette, so indifferent and heedless is it to the strange emotions it raises in the breast of man. It was a reckless spring that landed us on a ship's ladder, the rolling of the coal barge helping to increase the swell which had threatened to engulf us. Hardly had we reached deck when the barge was ordered to cut loose. Even as this was being done, the ship hoisted anchor and started on its way. Almost immediately there was a great commotion on board. About fifty ragged black men rushed frantically on deck to find that while depositing their last sacks of coal in the regions below, their barge and companions had cast off and were rapidly nearing the shore. Then followed dire chattering, wringing of hands, pulling of locks, and crying after the receding barge, all to no avail. The tide was coming in, a very strong tide it was, too, and despite the efforts of those on it, the barge was steadily swept inland. The captain appeased the coolies' fears by stating they should go off in the pilot's boat. We all gathered to see the sight, and a funny one it was. The tug being lashed to the ship, they first tried to take the men off without slowing down, but after one man got a dangerous plunge bath and the sea threatened to bury the tug, then the ship was forced to slow down. Some coolies slid down a cable, the comrades grabbing and pulling them wet and frightened white onto the tug. Others went down the ladder, which lacked five feet of touching the pilot boat. Those already on board would clutch the hanging man's bare legs, he meanwhile clinging despairingly to the ladder, fearing to loosen his grasp, and only doing so when the ship's officers would threaten to knock him off. The pilot, a native, was the last to go down. Then the cable was cast off, and we sailed away, seeing the tug, so overloaded that the men were afraid to move even to bail it out, swept back by the tide towards the place where we had last seen the land. I had a cabin down below at first, and I found little rest owing to the close proximity of a nurse and two children, whose wise parents selected a cabin on the other side of the ship. They could rest in peace. After I had been awakened several mornings at daybreak by the squabbling of the children, I cherished a grudge against the parents. The mother made some show of being a beauty. She had a fine nose, everybody confessed that, and she had reduced her husband to such a state of servitude and subjection that she needed no maids. 
i have always confessed that i like to sleep in the morning as well as i like to stay up at night and to have my sleep disturbed makes me as ill-natured as a bad dinner makes a man the fond father of these children had a habit of coming over early in the morning to see his cherubs before he went to his bath i know this from hearing him tell them so he would open their cabin door and in the loudest coldest most unsympathetic voice in the world would thoroughly arouse me from my slumbers by screaming good morning how is papa's family this morning a confused conglomeration of voices sounded in reply then he would shout what does baby say to mamma say what does baby say to mamma mamma baby would at length shout back in a coarse unnatural baby voice what does baby say to papa tell me baby what does baby say to papa papa would answer back the shrill treble what does the moo moo cow say my treasure tell papa what the moo moo cow says to this the baby would make no reply and again he would shout what does the moo moo cow say darling tell papa what the moo moo cow says if it had been once or twice even i might have endured it with civilized forbearance but after it had been repeated the very same identical word every morning for six long weary mornings my temper gave way and when he said tell papa what the moo moo cow says i shouted frantically for heaven's sake baby tell papa what the moo moo cow says and let me go to sleep a heavy silence a silence that was heavy with indignation and surprise followed and i went off to sleep to dream of being chased down a muddy hill by babies sitting astride cows with crumpled horns and straight horns and no horns at all all singing in a melodious cow-like voice moo 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 the fond parents did not speak to me after that they gazed on me in disdain and when the woman got seasick I persuaded an acquaintance of hers to go in and see her one day by telling her it was her Christian duty. The fond mother would not allow the ship doctor to see her, although her husband had to relate her ills to the doctor and in that way get him to prescribe for them. I knew there was something she wished to keep secret. The woman, true to my counsel, knocked on the door. Hearing no voice and thinking it lost in the roar of the ocean, opened the door. The fond mother looked up, saw, and screaming, buried her face in the pillows. She was toothless and hairless. The frightened Samaritan did not wait to see if she had a cork limb. I felt repentant afterwards and went to a deck cabin where I soon forgot the moo moo cow and the fond parents. But the woman's fame as a beauty was irrevocably ruined on the ship. It was so damply warm in the Straits of Malacca that for the first time during my trip. I confessed myself uncomfortably hot. It was sultry and foggy and so damp that everything rusted, even the keys in one's pockets, and the mirrors were so sweaty that they ceased to reflect. The second day out from Penang, we passed beautiful green islands. There were many stories told about the straits being once infested with pirates, and I regretted to hear that they had ceased to exist. I so longed for some new experience. We expected to reach Singapore that night. I was anxious that we should, for the sooner we got in, the sooner we should leave, and every hour lost meant so much to me. The pilot came on at six o'clock. I waited tremblingly for his verdict. A wave of despair swept over me when I heard that we should anchor outside until morning, because it was too dangerous to try and make the port after dark. And this was the result of slowing down to leave off the coolies at Penang. The mail contract made it compulsory for the ship to stay in port twenty-four hours, and while we might have been consuming our stay and so helping me on in my race against time, I was wasting precious hours lying outside the gates of hope, as it were, merely because some black men had been too slow. Those few hours might mean time loss of my ship at Hong Kong; they might mean days to my record. What agony of suspense and impatience I suffered that night! When I came on deck the next morning, the ship lay alongside the wharf, 
and naked Chinese coolies carrying, two by two, baskets of coal suspended between them on the pole, were constantly traversing the gangplank between the ship and shore, while in little boats about were peddlers with silks, photographs, fruits, laces, and monkeys to sell. The doctor, a young Welshman, and I hired a gary, a light wagon with latticed windows and comfortable seating room for four with the driver's seat on the same level outside. They are drawn by a pretty spotted Malay pony, whose speed is marvelous compared with its diminutive size, and whose endurance is of such quality that the law confines their working hours to a certain limit. Driving along a road as smooth as a ballroom floor, shaded by large trees, made picturesque by native houses built on pins in marshy land on either side, which tended to dampen our surprise at the great number of graveyards, and the generous way in which they were filled, we drove to the town. The graves were odd, being round mounds with walls shaped like horseshoes. A flat stone where the mound ends and the wall begins bears the inscriptions done in colored letters. There are no sidewalks in Singapore, and blue and white in the painting of the houses largely predominate over the other colors. Families seem to occupy the second story, the lower being generally devoted to business purposes. Through latticed windows we got occasional glimpses of peeping Chinese women in gay gowns, Chinese babies bundled in shapeless wadded garments, while down below, through widely open fronts, we could see the people pursuing their trades. Barbering is the principal trade. A chair, a comb, a basin, and a knife are all the tools a man needs to open shop, and he finds as many patrons if he sets up shop in the open street as he would under a shelter. Sitting doubled over, Chinamen have their heads shaven back almost to the crown, when a spot about the size of a tiny saucer is left to bear the crop of hair which forms the pigtail. When braided and finished with a silk tassel, the Chinaman's hair is done for the next fortnight. The people here, as at other ports where I stopped, constantly chew betel nut, and when they laugh, one would suppose they had been drinking blood. The beetle nut stains their teeth and mouthfuls blood red. Many of the natives also fancy tinting their fingernails with it. Nothing is patronized more than the rickshaws in Singapore, and while they are to be had for ten cents an hour, it is no unusual sight to see four persons piled in one gin rickshaw and drawn by one man. We visited a most interesting museum and saw along the suburban roads the beautiful bungalows of the European citizens. People in dog carts and wheelmen on bicycles crowded the splendid drives. We found the monkey cage, of course. There was beside a number of small monkeys, one enormous orangutan. It was as large as a man and was covered with long red hair. While seeming to be very clever, he had a way of gazing off in the distance with wide and seeing eyes, meanwhile pulling his long red hair up over his head in an aimless, insane way that was very fetching. The doctor wanted to give him a nut, but feared to put his hand through the bars. The grating was too small for the old fellow to get his hand through, but he did not intend to be cheated of his rights, so he merely stuck his lips through the gratings until they extended fully four inches. I burst into laughter at the comical sight. I had heard of mouths, but that beat anything I ever saw, and I laughed until the old fellow actually smiled in sympathy. He got the nut. The doctor offered him a cigar. He did not take it, but touched it with the back of his hand, afterward smelling his hand, and then subsided into that dreamy state, aimlessly pulling his hair up over the back of his head. At the cable office, in the second story of a building, I found the agents conversant with the English language. They would accept American silver at par, but they did not care to handle our other money. The bank and post office are open places on the ground floor with about as much comfort and style as is found in, in ordinary wharf warehouses. Chinese and English are employed in both places. We had dinner at the Hotel de l'Europe, a long, low, white building set back in a wide green lawn, with a beautiful esplanade faced by the sea, fronting upon it. Upon the veranda were long white tables where a fine dinner was served by Chinamen. On our return from the governor's house, I heard a strange, weird din, as of many instruments in dire confusion and discord, very like in sound to a political procession the night after the, the presidential election. 
"'That's a funeral,' my melee driver announced. "'Indeed. If that is the way you have funerals here, I'll see one,' I said. So he pulled the gary to one side, where we waited eagerly for the funeral that was heralded by a blast of trumpets. First came a number of Chinamen with black and white satin flags, which, being flourished energetically, resulted in clearing the road of vehicles and pedestrians. They were followed by musicians on melee ponies, blowing fifes, striking cymbals, beating tom-toms, hammering gongs, and pounding long pieces of iron with all their might and main. Men followed carrying on long poles roast pigs and Chinese lanterns, great and small, while in their rear came banner-bearers. The men on foot wore white trousers and sandals with blue top dress, while the pall-bearers wore black garments bound with blue braid. There were probably forty pall-bearers. The casket, which rested on long poles suspended on the shoulders of the men, was hidden beneath a white-spotted scarlet cloth with decorations of Chinese lanterns or inflated bladders on arches above it. The mourners followed in a long string of garys. They were dressed in white satin from head to toe, and were the happiest-looking people at the funeral. We watched until the din died away in the distance, when we returned to town as delighted as if we had seen a circus parade. "'I would not have missed that for anything,' Dr. Brown said to me. "'You could not,' I replied laughingly. "'I know they got it up for our special benefit.' And so, laughing and jesting about what to us had had no suggestion of death, we drove back to see the temples. None of us were allowed to pass beneath the gates of the Mohammedan temple, so we went on to a Hindu temple. It was a low stone building enclosed by a high wall. At the gateway leading to it were a superfluity of beggars, large and small, lame and blind, who asked for alms, touching their foreheads respectfully. The temple was closed, but some priests rushed forth to warn us not to step on the sacred old dirty stone passage leading to it with our shoes on. Its filth would have made it sacred to me with my shoes off. My comrades were told that removing their shoes would give them admission, but I should be denied that privilege because I was a woman. Why? I demanded, curious to know why my sex in a heathen land should exclude me from a temple, as in America it confines me to the side entrances of hotels and other strange and incommodious things. No, senora, no mother, the priest said with a positive shake of the head. I'm not a mother? I cried so indignantly that my companions burst into laughter, which I joined after a while, but my denials had no effect on the priest. He would not allow me to enter. In some sheds which lined the inner part of the high wall we saw a number of fantastically shaped carts of heavy build. Probably they were juggernauts. Nearby we saw through the bars a wooden image of a woman. Her shape was neither fairy-like nor girlish. Her features were fiendish in expression, and from her mouth fell a long string of beads. As the mother of a poor man's family, she would have been a great success. Instead of one pair of arms, she had four. One pair was employed in holding a stiff wooden baby before her, and the other three pairs were taking care of themselves, much like the legs of a crab. They showed us a white wooden horse mounted on wheels, images of most horrible devils. In short, we saw so many images of such horrible shapes that it would be impossible to recall them all. I remember one head that I was very much interested in, and the limited English of the priest failed to satisfy my curiosity as to who, what, and for what purpose the thing was invented. It was only a head, but it must have been fully twelve feet high and wide in proportion. The face was a fiery scarlet, and the eyes were tightly closed. On the lawn, fastened to a slight pin, was a white cow, the only presentable cow I saw during my trip. I noticed the doctor gave her wide range in keeping his eye on her as she playfully tossed her head. "'Be careful,' he said nervously to me. "'I believe that's the sacred white cow.' "'She looks old enough and tough enough to make her sacred in the eye of a butcher,' I replied. "'If she is the sacred cow,' he continued, despite my levity, and went for us, they would consider it their duty to let the old beast kill an infidel. That pen does not look very strong. So, to quiet the fears of the doctor, we left the old cow and the gods behind. The people in Singapore have ranks, as have people in other lands. 
There they do not wait for one neighbor to tell another, or for the newspapers to inform the public as to their standing, but every man, woman, and child carries his mark in gray powder on the forehead, so that all the world may look and read and know his caste. We stopped at the driver's humble home on our way to the ship, and I saw there on the ground floor his pretty little Malay wife, dressed in one wrapping of linen, and several little brown naked babies. The wife had a large gold ring in her nose, rings on her toes, and several around the rim of her ears, and gold ornaments on her ankles. At the door of their house was a monkey. I did resist the temptation to buy a boy at Port Said, and also smothered the desire to buy a Singalese girl at Colombo. But when I saw the monkey, my willpower melted, and I began straight away to bargain for it. I got it. "'Will the monkey bite?' I asked the driver, and he took it by the throat, holding it up for me to admire, as he replied, "'Monkey no bite?' But he could not under the circumstances. End of chapter 10